So uh, today we are talking about uh, chapter five and chapter six. So conditionals and then um, errors and debugging in JavaScript. And then after that, we will have a pair programming uh, demo courtesy of Patrick and Delaney. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, we already went over the agenda. Yeah, so this is where I was just talking about that. Um, I will say, I, I brought this back from day one, this slide. Um, I am going to stop periodically and take questions. Um, depending on how things are going, I, I might you may be able to just raise your hand and I can just answer. Um, I have to kind of feel that out. The more people we have, the harder that gets to manage. But, but you guys are a pretty small group um, compared to uh, most of the groups that I've taught before. So... Um, we, uh, but you can always use that Discord channel lecture questions, right? And even if I'm in the middle of talking and I'm paying attention to this, the TAs, IAs will keep an eye on that channel so that um, you, they can try to get, you know, get your question answered, um, even if I'm not like actively taking questions or, or you know, some people are just shy, right? You, you Maybe you don't want to speak up. Maybe you'd prefer to ask your question through the lecture questions channel. Totally cool. That's why we have it. Okay. Uh, and if you'd like to chat during this time about anything, uh, feel free to use the lecture chat channel. That's what that's for, because we don't have chat enabled in Zoom because it's impermanent. And uh, whereas Discord is um, is there where everybody can reference it later. OK, uh, so let's get let's just get past this. OK, um, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, here before we uh, jump into conditionals is just a reminder, if you're looking for those links to like my playlists, and um, the uh, lecture slides and all that. Again, that's on the homepage in, in Canvas and you can see down here, all the links are here for you. Um, so just a reminder, um, you can find most of the resources you need right here. Okay, we're just gonna close that. Let's talk about conditionals. So the Boolean data type is uh, what we were focusing on today. You've already learned about strings and numbers, so we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about what happens when you try to convert something like a string or a number to a Boolean. Like how does JavaScript uh, you know, evaluate that? And then <clears throat> we'll look at evaluating different types of Boolean expressions um, and the concept of loose equality versus strict equality, because JavaScript gives you a way to um, analyze uh, the difference between two things in a couple of different ways. And then uh, these logical operators, and, or, or not, if we want to have compound logic where we're evaluating more than one uh, Boolean expression at a time, we can have uh, these special operators. Then we'll use what we know about those Boolean expressions and evaluating them to work on uh, being able to do conditional statements. Um, this is called control flow in programming, where you uh, your, your code is executing from top to bottom, and then it gets to a certain point, and you stop and you say, okay, we can go one direction or we can go the other. Um, we're going to you know, figure out which direction we want to go here. So conditional statements will help us do that, and then we'll look at nested conditionals. What happens when your logic starts to get a little more complex? Okay. <clears throat> So the Boolean data type um, basically says, is something true or is it false? So it only has these two values, true and false. It must be lowercase. Um, you do not want to use quotes or it will suddenly be a string. JavaScript will no longer see it as a Boolean. Um, your variable name should typically indicate it's a Boolean. So um, here's an example of that. You know, I say, is learning? So we're asking the question, are we learning? Are we not learning? But of course you are learning, so that's true. Um, and uh, so again, when you're declaring these variables, you use that keyword let, and um, then you create the variable name that kind of indicates that it, it is a Boolean and give it a value with the assignment operator, <clears throat> just like that. Okay, so again, uh, true or false, no quotes. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanna say about that. Let me go and just show you a couple of examples here. Um, so we're going to initialize a couple of Booleans here and just print them out so you can see um, how they print. So let has flux capacitor, we have a theme guys, equal true, and let has power source equal false. Okay, um, so I'm gonna just log each of these and We'll run it. Okay, so I'm going to use the command node. I'm already in the chapter five folder. So all I have to do is say node conditionals.js. 
then here we go. I've got some titles over all of my different sections because there's eventually going to be a lot of output. So um, that's why all that stuff is there. True and false. So we just see those values come right out just like that. You'll notice that um, VS Code is uh, in the terminal here is actually highlighting those in color similar to the way it does numbers. So you can kind of see the difference between whether something is a string or if it's actually a Boolean value. So that's helpful because it doesn't actually put quotes on strings in the in the console, right? Okay, so that's a good start. Let's uh, talk about what happens when you try to evaluate something that's not Boolean as a Boolean. You can use the function Boolean, just like that function, uh, the two functions we learned yesterday, string and number, to try to convert something. And uh, so this, these are the rules. A number, uh, zero and not a number, will evaluate to false. Any other number, um, if it's a real number, will evaluate to true. Um, uh, so it can be positive, it can be negative, um, it can be a decimal, um, doesn't matter. Only zero and not a number will evaluate to false. So that's the rule for numbers. For strings, an empty string that has no length, there are no characters at all between those quotes, that will evaluate to false. Any other string that has a length of any kind is going to evaluate to true. It does not matter what it is. Um, and then there's these other special values that we're going to talk about later um, that uh, are called null and then undefined. You're going to see those come up um, as we get further into the course. Um, those will also evaluate to false. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Zero, not a number, empty string, null, undefined. Those all evaluate to false. So um, let's look at some examples here. Uh, oh, yeah, I have one more bullet point. Hey, you may hear the terms truthy and falsy uh, to refer to this. This is what we call it. We say that something, if, if it's not naturally a Boolean already, a true or false value, but we know that it's going to evaluate to true, true or false, we just say that's truthy or falsy. You're definitely going to hear me use these terms. Okay, so Boolean of four. Uh, somebody unmute themselves real quick and just tell me, um, you know, what that's going to evaluate to. True. True. Yeah, because it's not zero. Um, it's not not a number. Um, Boolean uh, of uh, uh, empty string. False. Great. How about uh, the string hello? True. True. How about null? False. False. That's right. Yeah. Null and undefined are special, uh, special values that will always be false. Good. Okay. Um, so let's do a couple of conversions over here. We are uh, going to see how, um, you know, these, these strings and numbers are actually truthy and falsy. So I will uh, console log scientist. I'll uh, console log speechless. Console log gigawatts needed. And console.log miles per hour at start. Okay, uh, let's run it. And we get, um... oh, I'm sorry. I'm console logging the values and what I mean to do <laughs> is convert them, try to convert them to Booleans. So I need to actually use this function and attempt to convert them and see what they turn out as. I'm not fi firing on all cylinders uh, this morning, apparently. Okay. I'll run this again. There we go. True, false, true, false. Okay, yeah, because Doc Brown has a length as a string, therefore it's truthy. Um, speechless, on the other hand, has no length, so it's false. Um, gigawatts needed has a value other than zero, and it's a real number, so that's um, true, but zero is faulty, so that comes out as false when I convert it. Okay, so that's the idea there. Um, this is going to come up from time to time. There are, there are certainly practical applications for when you might intentionally uh, use um, a string or a number as a Boolean, and we'll get into it. Um, let's talk now about equality operators. When you want to compare one value to another, what are the different operators that we can use? So there's uh, the equal, um, to say something, you know, if I want to test if something is equal to another thing, um, and then I can say not equal by using this bang operator. That's what we call the exclamation point, bang. 
Uh, so bang equals is not equal. Greater than, of course, you're familiar with. This is basic, uh, you know, like fifth grade math or something. Uh, less than, and then uh, greater than or equal, and less than or equal. So those appear exactly as you would expect them to, um, just like you do when you write them. So uh, let's try this out. Eight is less than or equal to eight. What's that going to evaluate to as an expression? True. That's yeah, going to be true. Two is not equal to seven. <clears throat> true. true. Also true. Okay, the string goodbye is equal to the string goodbye. False. False. Yeah, good. Um, in case you weren't aware, uh, you know, the program does consider capital letters and lowercase letters to be different. Um, it is case sensitive, which means if you try to compare something like this without converting the case, and that's something you'll learn how to do in chapter seven, um, you uh, are definitely going to get faults because they're not the same thing if they have, you know, capital G and a lowercase g. Okay. Um, let's look at uh, evaluating. Um, yeah, no, assigning them to a variable. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the returned value that comes back from that Boolean expression when it's evaluated, we can store that in a variable. And it looks a little funny at first. It's going to be a little hard to read, but um, you'll get used to it. Uh, it's not necessary to use parentheses to enclose the ex uh, Boolean expression, but if that helps you right now to see it more clearly, you totally can do that. So you'll see here in the examples, I've got math test, you know, I'm creating a variable and I'm saying I want to store the result of this Boolean expression in that variable. Two plus two is equal to five. We're asking the question, is that true or false? And then concat test, um, we're concatenating together, you know, uh, the strings A and B and testing whether that results in AB, right? Are those two things the same? Um, so you can kind of see, I've got some parentheses around this just to help you see that's the expression that we're evaluating. This is the variable we're storing it in uh, because this, this single equals is still an assignment operator, right? That has nothing to do with comparing equality. It's just to store a value. Um, that's an important difference. Single equals is for ass assignment, double equals um, or greater, because we also, are, I'm going to teach you about triple equals in a minute. Um, that is about comparing, um, you know, testing equality. So with these two examples, what do I expect math test is going to evaluate to? False. Yeah, it's false because two plus two does not equal five. How about concat test? True. True, yeah, because A plus B is AB when we concatenate those strings together. Okay, good. Uh, I'll come over and do a couple examples of this as well. Um, so we're gonna write a couple of Boolean expressions here um, and then print them. So I'll just uh, <clears throat> do it directly. I'll just say console.log Calvin plus Klein equals Calvin Fine. Okay. And you may already begin to see whether that's going to be true or false, right? True is not equal to zero. Okay. So think about those for a second. How do you think we're gonna, those are going to come out? What about the first one? There's not going to be the same. Right. Um, yeah, they're actually not going to be the same. What about the second one? That's false. Okay, true is not equal to zero. Oh, um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, so this is tricky, right? This is where we have to start to bend our brains a little bit. Okay, let's run it. And right, so the first one is false because there's no space, right? Calvin plus kind, these would be like crammed up against each other uh, when this side evaluates. So they're not the same. This one, true is not equal to zero. We said that zero was falsy, right? So we're essentially saying true is not equal to false. Um, and that entire thing is true. <laughs> true is not the same as false. So therefore the entire expression evaluates to true. So this is how you have to learn how to think. Um, it's a little bit, you know, um, maybe um, awkward at first to try to you know, wrap your heads around it sometimes when you see things like this. But sometimes you're going to be in situations where you're working with all these expressions and different things are evaluating and you have to be able to distill it down to that final value of true or false. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, check to see um, 
if this uh, speed is high enough for time travel, because we know that we have to get up to 88 miles per hour in order to achieve uh, travel to the back, uh, back to the future, right? Oh, by the way, t-shirt guys, totally have my back to the future t-shirt. <laughs> I don't have a t-shirt. You were wearing it. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a t-shirt for all of the themes that I'm going to have this unit, but I do for the first two days. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, current speed is 65, time travel speed is 88. We want to find out if it's fast enough and we're going to store it in this variable. So we need to do this comparison on the other side of the assignment operator and actually say uh, the current speed is greater than or equal than the time travel speed. And that's going to help us, you know, actually uh, figure out whether that's true or false. So I will log fast enough so we can see the result. And of course it's false. We are not yet quite at the speed we need to be to achieve uh, time travel. Okay, who has questions about anything I've done so far? Go ahead and raise your hand. Anybody? It's okay if you don't. I just wanna make sure I give time for questions if you have them. Okay. Um, then I'm going to move forward. He's got plenty to talk about still. All right, there's a concept of loose equality and strict equality in JavaScript. Um, it evaluates things a little bit differently depending on what operator you use. So double equals and bang equal are loosely equal and not loosely equal. Uh, and this, the idea here is that it does not convert data types before it compares. So, um, it will allow you to evaluate things um, regardless of the data type. Um, I'm sorry, I just said this. I said it backwards. It does convert the data types before it compares, and that actually allows it to do this loose idea of saying like, you know, four is a number, four is a string. You know, we can compare that and decide if that ultimately is going to be true, um, you know, if they're the same or not. Strict equality, on the other hand, um, Oh, sorry, I ran through the examples. Yes, so <laughs> I should pay attention to what order things are gonna pop up on my screen. Okay, um, right, so four is, uh, when you compare this loosely to the string four, it actually takes the time to convert the string four to a number first and then compare it on that basis. So now we have four equals four, which is true. Um, here we have 2.0 and uh, we try to convert that to a number and compare it to two and say that's not equal, well, those are actually equal. JavaScript will take 2.0, convert it to a number and say, oh yeah, that's just two. And so it compares these two and they are equal. So that means that entire expression is false because we were trying to assert that they were not equal, but they are. Okay, uh, strict equality. This is the triple equals. And then bang equal equal is the uh, not strictly equal. And this is where uh, the data type absolutely has to be the same for this to work out. So if I say two is strictly equal to the strings uh, two, what am I gonna get? False. False. Right, because False. We, we know that the string two can be converted to two, but this operator is not going to check for that. It's going to look, you know, am I dealing with something that's both the same data type and ultimately the same value? Uh, if I take um, the string one and I concatenate the number one, is that going to be equal to the um, string 11, uh, strictly speaking? Yes. True. Yeah, it's true. Because we learned yesterday that when um, JavaScript is evaluating concatenation, as soon as it runs across a string, it tr starts treating everything like a string, right? So it's going to actually just concatenate those as string characters, which means we get one and one side by side. Yeah, so that's true. Okay, good. Uh, let's see, I've got a little note here. Yeah. People often ask, what is the best practice? How do you decide whether you're going to use double equal or, or triple equal, right? The best practice with JavaScript is to always use strict equality by default. There are circumstances in which you might use double equal um, on purpose, but I would say just always default to strict equality unless you run up against one of those situations. And that way you are um, being being the strictest about checking your equality, which, which is a good idea always. So, um, that's my advice. Let's uh, take a look at some examples here. All right. I'm sorry, really quick. I just uh, wanted to make sure I understand. So um, we only concatenate when we're doing the uh, 
the triple equal? Uh, no, you can concatenate anytime you want. I just, um, I, I was just pointing out that because this situation, it sees the string first, it means it's mm. going to start treating this like a string while it's evaluating this side. And so by the time it gets done evaluating this, this side, it does look exactly like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, you could certainly try this with a double equal. Um, and uh, it would still come out the same, actually. Yeah. Okay. Because it, it evaluates each side independently before it, before it evaluates the equality. So it definitely would always do this part first and then, you know, check to see this part. Okay, um, let's come up back over here. Okay, so I'm going to compare uh, the string eight. We'll just see how this comes out. Uh, the string 8.0 loosely to the number eight. And I'll also compare um, the string eight strictly to the number eight. And those should come out not quite the same. Right, the first one's true because it converts the data type, converts it to a number. The second one, <clears throat> it doesn't bother converting. So we have a string and a number and those are never gonna be strictly equal. Katie, you've got a question? Yeah, sorry, it took me a while to find the, <laughs> the hand raised question. It's actually from the previous thing, screen. Okay. Um, could you, I'm, I guess I am struggling with that. The strict equality, it, there, whoopsie, I'm sorry, I'm touching things. Whoa, I lost, uh, hold on, I lost my, well, I can do it from memory. Um, I, it, they must be the same data types. Can you explain that? Because those aren't the same data types or what? Right. So um, um, the first example that I have is that the number two is strictly equal to the string two. And as long as you're using triple equals, um, that will always be false because they're two different data types. Um, it does not convert the data type before it evaluates the equality, whereas double equal will. So that's why four is loosely equal to the string four will be true because it's going to take the time to change that four to a number and then to see if they're the same thing. But here okay. it, it won't do that. I was actually looking at the very bottom one though then, sorry. My oh, screen. this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it evaluates the one on the left <clears throat> first and the string one concatenated with the number one becomes um, 11. In, in okay, four. thank you. So they're both equal regardless of whether it's strict or... Uh, or um, or loose because it's going to evaluate this first anyway. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we see these come out to true and false um, because the second one is strictly equal. Therefore, they're two different data types, so it's false. Uh, let's do um, a comparison of Boolean values. <clears throat> Excuse me. Console.log. Let's say false is not equal to zero. And we'll try um, false is uh, strictly not equal to zero. How do you think these are going to come out? Uh, both false. Okay. False and true. False and true. Okay. Let's run it. False and true. That's right. So um, the first one's false because if we are loosely evaluating them, <clears throat> it goes ahead and converts the zero to a Boolean and false is equal to false. So this expression to say they're not equal is, is, is false. Uh, whereas this one, um, they're two different data types. This is a Boolean, this is a number. So if there's strict equality going on, then um, th that has to be true because they're not the same thing if you're taking data types into consideration. Okay, so I know that this also is a little bit mind bending, but that's why I'm going over it is to, to help you start to sort that out in your head. And the more you work with this kind of stuff, the easier it comes to just kind of remember it automatically, like most things, right? Um, so that that should help you out. Okay, let's talk about the logical operators. We've got um, and is the first one we want to talk about. We're going to do and, or, and not. So and, the concept here is that um, we're going to use this operator double ampersand and that allows you to evaluate more than one Boolean expression together. And when you use this, the way that JavaScript decides whether to return true or false in the end when it evaluates all of it is that every single individual expression has to evaluate to true. 
they all have to be true in order for the entire thing to be true. That's what and means. So we say, you know, um, this expression is true and this expression is true. And if both of those things are true, the entire thing is true. So let's look at these one at a time. Um, and <clears throat> I'm using parentheses here at the beginning so that it's easier for you to read these as separate uh, expressions. Um, ultimately, we'll get down here. There will be no parentheses. And probably most of the time when you see it, it's going to be that way. So you'll have to get used to reading it. But um, if you see that ampersand, ampersand, then there's going to be an expression on one side and an expression on the other side. And it, JavaScript is going to evaluate th this to a Boolean true or false, and it's going to evaluate this to a Boolean true or false, no matter what you put there. So uh, we say eight is less than nine and five is loosely equal to the string five. How's that going to come out? True. 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 Yeah, because they're both true, right? Uh, what about two times two is less than or equal to four? And A concatenated with B is strictly equal to ABC. False. 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 Yeah, because the first one is true, right? No problem. But the second one is false. So if any, you know, even one of them is, is false, the entire thing has to be false with and. Okay, last one. High is equal to high strictly. And uh, seven is less than or equal to 11. And three is strictly equal to um, the string three. False. False. Right. The first two are true, but the last one is false. So again, the entire thing, therefore, must be false. Okay. Um, that's uh, that's the logical operators. And again, those parentheses are totally optional. You can use them if it helps you to read things a little more easily as you're getting used to this. Uh, it allows you to put them in, but you also don't need them. Okay. Uh, let's talk about or. So or, as you can imagine, is a little bit different. Um, you're going to use this double pipe operator, and then that will allow you to evaluate more than one. And uh, only one of them has to be true for the entire thing to be true. You're giving, you're, you're having some, you know, um, options here. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> let's look at this. Uh, eight is greater than nine. Well, that's false, right? Um, we say, or uh, five is strictly equal to five. That's also false, which means um, the entire thing has to be false because none of them are true. We're only looking for one of them to be true and then, and then the whole thing will be true. Okay, so two times two is less than four. And then A plus B concatenates loosely to um, AB. True. Second, yeah. Um, the first one's false. Um, two times two is not less than four. It's equal to four, right? But the second one is true. So therefore, the entire thing is true because we, we're using or. Last one, high equals high. That's false. Seven plus three is 11. Also false. Three is loosely equal to the string three. Well, loose equality, it converts the data type. That means this one is true. So we have true. Okay, this is how this works. All right, last one is not. Uh, we're gonna use this operator bang to get the opposite value. Um, it, it goes in front of the expression or the variable name. Um, and uh, so you have to evaluate everything um, inside parentheses sometimes if it's if it's complex enough. Um, if it's just a variable name, you can just put it on the front of the variable name. Um, yeah, so so parentheses are really if you just want the opposite of an entire expression, because as we learned uh, yesterday, um, it's going to evaluate everything inside the parentheses first. That's the order of operations. So uh, we have a co uh, some code here, let is even equal false. We have stored the value false and it is even. So what does not is even evaluate to? True. Yeah, it gives you the opposite, right? Um, so we have the expression six times four is equal to 24. And then we're taking the opposite of that. Is that true or false? False. False. It's, it's false because this evaluates the true and then the bang negates it. it. It makes it the opposite. All right, A plus B is equal to A space B as a string. Is that, uh, but we're uh, the opposite of it. Yeah, so true. It's, mm. yeah. we're saying not false, which is the same thing as true. That's right. Okay, so let's go over and, uh, nope, I think I've got one more um, before we code. Okay, yeah, precedence. So I just mentioned precedence. We talked about PEMDAS yesterday with parentheses. 
when you bring logical operators into it, it, it ramps it up even more, right? You have uh, another level of order of operations. So the individual expressions get evaluated before the lo logical operator is evaluated. Um, but it, again, if you want an entire thing to be evaluated, you have to put it in parentheses before it'll then expand outside of that and start evaluating um, things past that. So I have this example, three plus two is strictly equal to five and this entire thing, 10 divided by five is strictly equal to two or four times five is strictly equal to 25. Um, we have to evaluate what's in the parentheses first. And um, because we have multiple logical operators, we have an and and we have an or, and you have to tell JavaScript which ones to do first. Otherwise, it's just going to start doing this and this, and then maybe it would evaluate this last. But we actually want to figure out what the truth is here before we compare it and say, is this true? And is this entire thing true? So it's going to actually do these parts first. And so then this one evaluates to true and this one evaluates to false, right? So then it's going to take that logical operator or and evaluate this. And then that simplifies to true because only one of them had to be true. So then we compare three plus two is equal to five and true. And that of course, um, all evaluates to true because they're both true with the and um, operator. So that's how it works. Uh, and, and this is important because the thing about learning to code is you have to learn how to think like a computer, right? And so you have to understand how JavaScript's gonna evaluate these things to write your code so that it logically does everything exactly the way you expect it to. Otherwise things will, you'll get unexpected results because it's not thinking the same way you <laughs> intended it to. So this is important to understand uh, how to write these things. Let's uh, do some examples. We're gonna use uh, and first, uh, we've got three expressions here, okay. So let's just look at these. Expression one is great Scott is strictly equal to great Scott plus a uh, exclamation point. And we know that that is true, right? So we call that truthy um, or true. Uh, it actually just comes out to be true. And then um, 1955 is less than or equal to 1985. That's also true. Uh, 10.04, the decimal number, is equal, strict, uh, loosely equal to the time, 10, uh, 10 o'clock uh, in four minutes. Absolutely not true, right? False. Nothing to do with one another, decimals and colons. Okay. So um, even if it's loosely equal and it takes this and it tries to convert it to a number, that is not going to come out to 10.04. So, uh, so we have three different expressions, each individually uh, evaluating to true, true, and false. So now we want to actually say, let's combine them in different ways with these logical operators and see what the final result is. So the first one, I'm going to determine if all three of them are true. So I'll say expression one and expression two and <laughs> expression three. Okay, so we'll run that. And of course, one of them is false, which means we're gonna get false, right? Because with and, they all have to be true in order for for the entire thing to be true. With or, uh, let's just see if either expression two or expression, uh, expression three is true. Um, so we'll say uh, console log expression two, and then use the double pipe or expression three and see uh, how that comes out. Is either of them true? And that's true, right? Um, the last one would be to use not to print the opposite of expression two. So right now, um, expression two evaluates to true. So if we print the opposite, we expect this to be false. And it is. And then the last one is to print uh, the opposite of both expression one and expression three. So we're going to be combining a couple of different um, operators here, and that means we need parentheses to clarify which is to be evaluated first. Um, <clears throat> so I'll I'll do the console log, and then we're going to do this entire expression inside these parentheses. But if I were to just say not expression one and expression two, I'm sorry, expression three, um, it, it's going to evaluate this first, 
not expression one, which would be false, and um, and expression three, which is false. And uh, what we actually want it to do is to evaluate the opposite of both of them. Because um, these together, one's true, one's false, this entire thing is going to evaluate as false, but then we want the opposite of that and it's going to come out true. And that would not be what happens if we if we didn't um, put the parentheses around it before applying that not operator. So uh, yeah, so it, it ends up being true because we're saying it's the opposite of that expression inside. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about what I've done so far here? that you haven't already asked. I know there's already been some questions and I am totally not checking the lecture questions channel. Looks like Matt's on it. Uh, I have a question. Okay. With the or symbol, so I noticed with the and you were able to stack all three. Can you just keep stacking them with the or? And yes. if is it's like, if you have like eight, would it just be, it just takes one being true for them all to be true? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. It is that simple. Yeah, as long as you don't need some subset of them to take precedence, then you can just, if you want to make them all equally possible, then yeah, just keep keep using them. Just like I did up here with the ands. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, conditionals now, if uh, if else statements and start to apply um, these Boolean expressions. And um, then uh, once we get through talking about this, we will take a break and you know give you guys a little bit of a rest before we uh, do our debugging lecture. Okay, so uh, true or false, right? We can program different outcomes for our, pro for our code uh, using this conditional logic. And it helps to think of it conceptually, um, you know, uh, syntactically, we're using if and else um, syntax, and we'll have two different blocks of code and say, you know, one of these two is going to execute. Um, so we just have to decide how to tell it which one to choose. Um, so we will give it some sort of condition, a variable or expression that's going to evaluate to true or false, and then it can decide which of the, the blocks of code to execute. So let's say we're asking, you know, we're going to make breakfast for some friends. We're making pancakes, we've got some fruit. We're not sure if we have enough eggs to make eggs. So we're gonna ask that question. If it's true, great, let's have eggs. If it's not true, potatoes, I've got potatoes. That'll make enough food for everybody. I'll make some roasted potatoes, no problem. Okay, so <laughs> um, this is the kind of, uh, you know, the, the decision that you have to make. Um, and it looks a little, you know, a little bit like a decision tree, right? Um, or flow chart. It's exactly what we're talking about, control flow. We ask a question, we go one direction or we go the other, and our code does different things depending on which it is. So um, let's talk about the syntax a little bit. You've got this if statement. Um, you're gonna use the keyword if, and then follow it with a Boolean condition in parentheses. And then you'll use these curly braces to enclose the code block. That's how you recognize the block of code that may or may not be executed. Um, only if the condition is true, otherwise it just gets skipped. Um, so, and we don't even have to have an else yet, right? We can just have something and say, we may execute this, we may not, otherwise we may skip it and just move on in our code um, as it's executing from top to bottom. Um, but you want to make sure that you indent whatever the code is inside that block. It makes it easier to read. If everything is back against this wall, <laughs> it becomes really hard to read your code and see what's inside and what's not. So uh, get in the habit now of indenting. Your employer will expect you to have good, clean code. So just get in the habit now. Just, um, you know, your... your um, Code editor, VS Code is going to help you with this. It'll automatically do some indenting for you. But things might get wacky um, it's from time to time. So um, I'll show you a trick in a minute if I remember too on how to adjust things if you need to. Uh, okay. So do not use a semicolon at the very end. This is the type of um, mechanism that actually does not require a, uh, a semicolon at the end. You just have that closing curly brace and that's it. Okay. Um, 
but any lines of code that you have inside the code block do need semicolons like normal. Those are just regular lines of code. So again, here's the keyword if, and here's the condition. We say, um, you know, only if X is less than 10. Um, if that's true, we want to increment X, and then we want to console log, um, you know, X equals, um, and then the number um, after we have modified it. So that entire thing is that code block right there. Um, and again, yeah, always keep things indented. It will help you read your code better. It helps other people read your code better. Your IAs will thank you when they're reviewing your code. Um, and uh, that's pretty much how that works. So just out of curiosity, uh, what would console log here if, um, if X was five when we start out? It would print X equals six. Yes, X equals six. It would increment it and then print it. What would it? Uh, what would happen if I um, if I had x is twelve? It would run, but not print anything. It would just skip over this entire block of code. That's right. That's the beauty of logic. Um, if this condition is false, it's not even going to bother executing these lines of code. It just skips over them. Okay, good. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the condition. You know, what types of things can you put between these parentheses to use for your logic? The condition is always expected to resolve to true or false, a Boolean value, no matter what you put in there. So um, it can be a variable that already has a Boolean value stored in it. Um, it can be an expression with some sort of a quality operator. Uh, or um, it can be, you know, it can include logical operators like and or or or, or not that we just talked about. Um, and it can even be a string or a number, and then it's going to automatically convert it to a Boolean. You don't have to use the Boolean function to do that because it's doing that behind the scenes already. If you put, you know, if some sort of string or if some sort of number, it's just going to try to convert it to a, a Boolean. And we learned earlier uh, exactly how it's going to decide whether that's true or false, right? Numbers, not a number would be zero. Any other number is true. Um, an empty string is false, but any other string that has a length is true. So um, you can, if you ever have things coming out a little bit how you not don't expect, you can pay attention. Oh, did I give it a Boolean expression that I meant to, or did I give it a string or a number? And maybe that's why it's not coming out. Or maybe you're doing that on purpose. You're saying, you know, if this exists uh, or if it if it's zero or if it's not, um, it's just totally up to you, but there's lots of options, but no matter what the, the point is, however you construct your Boolean um, expression, it will always automatically try to convert it to true or false because it needs to know how to decide whether it's going to execute that code or not. So let's say we have a variable is even, and it's uh, storing the value of the result of this expression num mod two is strictly equal to zero. Um, and so we say, if is even, then we would do stuff. So that's that's the Boolean expression, right? Um, and then is even is the condition that's part of this if block. Same thing here. We have this if block that um, is evaluating both is even and the number is greater than 100. So we'll say, you know, uh, here, all we care about is that it's even, and then this code will execute. But here, we we care not only does it have to be even, it also has to be a number greater than 100. And then this code will execute, otherwise it won't. All right. Um, we've got uh, the else statement. This is going to build on our if a little bit. So you would use this keyword else and allow the logic to continue. Um, and you'll use another set of curly braces to define another block of code. And essentially the way this works, if you have this binary choice, it's like either this is true and we'll execute this, or this is true, or, or that is not true, and so we'll execute this instead. Um, the else statement doesn't have a condition. It doesn't need to. Um, if it's the very last thing, that's basically saying if nothing else you know, has re if this one has not resolved to true, then I'm just going to execute this instead. Um, so you don't need, it actually won't allow you to put a condition when you use just else. Um, it's just automatically going to do 
do something. And these are connected, right? You see how we've structured this to, to where the closing bracket of the first code block is before the else keyword and the opening black bracket of this block is after the else keyword. So um, let's uh, let's take a look at this. Um, these keywords are if and else. Those are the keywords that um, are you know important for the syntax for JavaScript to know what to do. And then there's that condition. If this condition's true, it'll it'll set our greeting that we declared up here. So remember, I said uh, yesterday that there's going to be cases where you might want to declare a variable without actually initializing it. This is one of those times. We want to be able to say, I have a, I have a variable and I, I want to set the um, value, but I don't know what I want to set it to yet. Um, and so you declare it here, stick a semicolon on there and say, okay, JavaScript, I'm just letting you know you've got this variable to work with. Then we get in here and we say, we're either going to initialize it as let's get started, or we're going to initialize it as welcome back. Um, and this is a very common type of thing to do with a website, right? You go and you log into your website and maybe you're a new user that just registered. And so they'll say, let's get started. Otherwise you're coming back, you're a returning user. So instead they'll say, welcome back. This is how this stuff is done. Um, you know, they take a look at things and, um, you know, can make decisions and display different information for you, depending on what the case is, um, <clears throat> happens all the time. This is the very uh, basics of this, but that's a practical application. Uh, so, um, of course, we're we're still working in the console for now, but that's okay. We're going to get there. We'll get to websites. Um, in this case, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out about this is uh, this idea of scope. We're going to talk about this again later, but I just briefly want to talk about the fact that the reason you have to declare this ahead of time, if I was to use the let keyword in here and uh, here and here, because only one of the two of them would execute, that would actually be legal. The problem is then maybe I want to use the greeting after this after this is completely done down here. It would not be in scope. If it's declared inside the if block, I don't have access to it out here. Um, so that's why I actually am declaring it before I even start my logic and then just initializing it one way or the other, because then it's still available to me down here. Don't worry too much about that, but I wanted to point it out now in case you're already asking that question um, or in case you try some of this stuff out and you were trying to initialize it in here and then try to use it later and be like, why is it saying it can't find this variable? That's why um, you have to initialize it outside the if else to be able to use it later. I'm sorry, not initialize, declare. You have to declare it. Um, okay, so uh, when you are thinking through how to set up your code, it helps to talk about that logic in a sentence. If X is true, do this. Otherwise, do that, right? That's how you can kind of think of this. If this is true, uh, do this. Otherwise, else, do that, okay? It's gonna execute one, or it's going to execute the other, not both. All right, uh, one more uh, little bit of uh, syntax to introduce here, and then we're going to do some practical examples. So um, else and if. Um, you can actually put these two together so that you can have multiple conditions and not just a binary choice. The keywords else if uh, together allow you to do this um, intermediately after if and before else. So you have to give this condition because you have to then clarify, you know, uh, there's other specific, uh, you know, reasons why you might execute that code. Um, so you use another set of curly braces to enclose that code. And it essentially says, um, you know, if you haven't already executed code before this, then, then take this into consideration and maybe code it if it's true. Um, and uh, otherwise it's gonna skip it. So, what I mean by that, um, yeah, and it always goes between if and else. It's it's going to start at the top and it's going to look at the first one. As soon as it hits one of these that's true, then it skips the rest of them and moves on when you have them all grouped together like this. Um, they would have to be completely independent in order for you to uh, evaluate them, you know, have a chance of evaluating the rest of them. So as long as we only intend for these to be mutually exclusive, we only want one of these four things to, to execute, we want to do it this way. If, else if, else if, else. So there's all those keywords, right? And if we have um, you know, some sort of, of degrees of weather in Fahrenheit, 
um, depending on whether it's greater than 85 degrees or if it's not 85, we, then we can just say, okay, what if it's greater than 65? We already know it's not greater than 85. Um, and then, oh, well, maybe it's not greater than 65. So then we check and say, is it greater than 32? Um, and you'll notice I don't have to check for the upper range at that point because I've already ruled out that upper range. Um, so I can keep these relatively simple by doing them in a logical order and just, you know, ruling out um, a whole other range and then just keep narrowing it down and narrowing it down. And then I get to the point where if it's less, if it's 32 or less, then I don't need to keep checking for specific ranges anymore. I can just say else and then just say, okay, anything 32 or less is frigid, <laughs> not just chilly. Um, okay. So somebody tell me if I was to um, have a value of degrees that was um, 43, uh, what would description um, be set to? What would be the value stored in description? Chili. Yeah, because um, it's not greater than 85. It's not greater than 65, but we get here and it is greater than 32. So description gets set. It gets initialized to the value chili. Good. And then it skips this one altogether and just moves on. Okay. So uh, I would like to go ahead and do some, some coding here, I think, um, before I talk about nested, um, nested conditionals. Yeah, let's go over and do some stuff. Okay. So uh, we've got a variable here, let has plutonium equal false. So we've got a Boolean to work with. We wanna write an if statement that prints a message. Um, if the DeLorean is fully equipped for time travel in 1985. Uh, and so we can say, you know, if, ha and do I need to say has plutonium equals true? Can I get away with not saying that? Yeah, you can use a Bing statement, maybe? Um, the Bing? Yes. Yeah, I actually don't, I, I don't want to use Bing because I actually want this to be, I want to evaluate this, whether it's true or false directly and not the opposite. But I don't need to say is true because, um, uh, because. Um, oh, so it, what if I did strictly? It's, it's already um, a true or false value, right? So if you have a Boolean that's already uh, evaluating true or false, you can leave this alone and just say, if has plutonium, right? All that you need to have between the parentheses is something that evaluates to true or false. So all I have to say is, is this true or false? And depending on whether we've set this to true or false, and you know maybe we don't know that yet. I, I've got it set just so we can uh, test it, but maybe we don't know what that is yet. We're just saying, okay, if it has plutonium, um, then, and I'm gonna establish my code block, and I'm going to say, I'm going to log, um, and I'm going to format it a little bit here with a escape character. Character, the flux capacitor is powered up, and the DeLorean, and <laughs> the DeLorean is ready to go. Okay. Um, now we want to add an else statement that's going to print something different. Um, so I actually need to do that right here. Uh, the common convention is to, to just uh, put it right after the closing thing so that it's very clear to you when you read it that it's all part of the same logical uh, you know, process. So I'll put else here. I can actually just move this up if I want to so that they're both there, that's fine. Um, okay, and then I'll just log something different instead and say um, the DeLorean won't travel through time without fuel for the nuclear reactor. Okay. So right now, uh, has plutonium's fault. So which one of these am, am I gonna get? Second statement. Yeah, it's gonna say the DeLorean won't travel through time without fuel for the nu nuclear reactor. Uh, so then um, I do a very bad deal with the Libyans or something and uh, we, see we have this um, set to true. And so uh, now we can run it and it says the flux capacitor is powered up, the DeLorean's ready to go. Okay, uh, Logan, you got a question? Uh, I just wanted to know what the hotkey was to move the line up like you just did. Yeah, um, on a Mac it's option, up or down arrow. 
very handy. Didn't learn that when I was a student either. So yeah, you're, you're going to be uh, ahead of me on that. Uh, on a PC, it's probably alt, I'm guessing. Um, alt. Yeah, which is, is equivalent to option on Mac. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's very handy. You also can hold down the shift key and uh, use that a shift, shift option or shift alt with the up or down arrow will uh, create a copy of your code too, which is super useful. You'll see me do that. Um, I'm going to undo that. Control Z. Okay. Or Command Z on my computer. Okay. So yeah. So now we've seen that depending on whether this evaluates to true or false, we see a different result. It's going to be one or the other. That's control flow. We're making our code execute exactly how we want it to using a little bit of logic. All right. Let's do another one. This time we're going to have a series of if else statements to determine what year the DeLorean is going to travel to, uh, because depending on um, you know where we are and which year we're going to, we have different ways of powering up the DeLorean, right? Uh, so we'll say cable electrified is false. I'm going to change this back to false for a minute. Cable electrified is false. Has banana peels is true, and we have um, we want to set the destination year, but we don't know what it's going to be yet. So um, if, the if the destination year has been set, um, we're going to uh, print something that includes it. Um, otherwise, we're going to print some sort of, oh, we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to do that later. Sorry, that's, that's, let's do this part first. All we're doing now is setting destination year. So if has plutonium, then the destination year is going to be set to 1955. Else if, and we have to have another specific uh, condition here, um, cable electrified. Then the destination year is equal to 1985. Now I'm going to do something here. Uh, you might think the next thing I'm going to do is just else, but I'm not. Uh, I'm going to be specific and say if we have banana peels, because we have to allow here for the possibility that we that all of them are false, right? Um, and then we might want to do something else. But for now, I'm just going to say uh, destination year is 2015. Um, and we will uh, only set this if, if one of those three things is true. And it's going, to, it's going to set it based on the very first one it comes across. So right now we have false, false, and true. So we can be pretty sure um, that, uh, you know, it's going to console.log. And um, I can start by just doing that. I can just say console.log and say, let's see, how are we doing on time? We're doing all right. All right. Um, no destination date has been set. Do you have the materials you need to power the flux capacitor? And so, um, I'm sorry, that's for later. Guys, not falling on, uh, firing on all cylinders. They mentioned that. Okay, uh, to, <laughs> to use a car analogy. Okay, um, ready to go. Actually, I think that's like a fighter jet analogy, but that's okay. I grew up uh, in a family of uh, Air Force pilots. <laughs> I have all the analogies. Okay, uh, your metaphors. It was a metaphor. I'm going to stick to coding. All right, destination year plus. An exclamation point. Wow, I should have just copied and pasted that. Okay. But here we're going to use the destination year. So we've got we've got one that's true. This is going to work. Um uh ready to go. You're headed to the year 2015. Okay, so this is a great example of where we put a little logic in behind the scenes that the user never sees, and it determines what they're going to see um, when we do actually use it uh, later on. Again, this is why I had to declare this here. If I had not done that. And I had just said, okay, one of these is going to execute, and I'm just going to have to declare it here. If I go to run this, I'm going to get an error. Um, let me pull this up so you can see the whole error message. Destination year is not defined. It can't find it because I declared it inside the if statement. So let me undo all of that. And now that it's here, it can find it. What happens? So I'm going to change these around. I'm going to change this one to true. Um, say both are true. Uh, so now when I run it, we should see something different because it actually hit the second one and set it to 1985 and then it stopped looking. It didn't even bother evaluating the next one. As soon as, when you have them set up in sequence like this, it, as soon as it hits one that's true, it, it's done. Um, so it set it to 1985 and it moved on. So now we see 1985. What if all of them are false, right? 
we have only allowed for three specific conditions with else and um, else if and else if here. We don't have a, a final else, right? So if I run this right now, we're going to see something interesting. It's going to say, ready to go. You're headed to the year undefined. Well, you don't ever want your user to see that, right? Um, and what did I say about undefined? If it gets evaluated as a Boolean, it evaluates to what? False. False, yeah. So what we can do is actually just plan on that and say, let's have a little bit more um, logic. And I'm just going to say, if destination year. Now we know that's going to seem strange, but this is where that truthy faulty thing comes in, right? Um, if destination year has been set to a number and that number is not zero, then this is going to evaluate to true. And so if I do that, I can just push this right up in here and say, yeah, we're going to go ahead. We have a year we can work with. So we're going to go ahead and, and do this. Else, if we don't have a year we can work with and that comes back as zero or undefined or whatever, um, and because we only uh, declared it, we did not instantiate it. I'm sorry, not instantiate, initialize it. Um, it doesn't have any value at all. It's undefined. So this will then evaluate to false, which means it can uh, do this one instead. So let's uh, try it out. There we go. No destination date has been set. Do you have the materials you need to power the flux capacitor? And then we can say, oh yeah, we're going to need that. So maybe I come back up here and I set this one to true. And now we run it again. And it hit, uh, you know, the very first one, 1955, because has plutonium was true. Okay. So that's how that works. Our last topic before we take our break is nested conditionals. So uh, again, this idea of a decision tree, you have you know, multiple directions you can go um, and, you, and you might need to nest your conditionals to do this. Uh, so it's kind of like creating branches with different paths. And um, so you know, we said before, if we don't have enough eggs for everyone, then we're gonna have to do roasted potatoes, right? Uh, but if we do have eggs, maybe from there, we say, oh, but eggs would be really good with cheese. So do I have cheese? And so then you're making another decision. So then you have to say, okay, I've got, you know, yes or no, right? So if yes, I have cheese, then um, woohoo, you know, we can have eggs and cheese. If I don't have cheese, then, you know, we're just going to have eggs. And some of you are already saying, but cheese is so good on roasted potatoes, right? Yeah, but I, I, that was not my thought process. I didn't even think about the cheese until I said, oh, I've got eggs, great, you know? Because remember, it does not even continue to evaluate faults here if this already evaluates to true. We don't even go over here and think about this, right? Um, it just keeps going with whatever's true. So um, we're, if, if both of these things are true, it's gonna go straight from here to here to here. Um, so, you know, how would we code that? Let's take a look at that. You want to make sure your nested blocks of code continue to follow that indenting rule so that you can be very clear on what you're looking at. Um, but oop, go back. Okay. Let's say we start out saying we know for breakfast, we're going to have pancakes, fruit, and something, but we don't know what it is. So we're going to start our string out and we're going to build our string, uh, with more, uh, more words here, depending on our logic. So we'll say, if we've got eggs, if we've got enough eggs for everybody, you know, uh, at least four eggs, maybe more, then we're going to just add eggs, right? Breakfast is eggs. Otherwise, we'll say we're going to add roasted potatoes. So pancakes, fruit, and eggs, or pan pancakes, fruit, and roasted potatoes. Right now, on the primary conditional logic, we have if and else. This entire thing works just as it is, right? But then we say, okay, if we do have eggs, maybe we want to add on a little bit more. This is where we're going to put one more nested conditional statement. If we have cheese, then we'll also add with cheese. Pancakes, fruit, and eggs with cheese. That's how that would read because we continue using that um, a compound assignment operator to tack on more words to the existing string. So this is how this works. And you know that's that's the nested statement there. Um, let me go back. The nested statement um, inside the other if statement. Um, so if this looks a little bit hard to read right now, that's okay. You'll get used to it. Don't worry about that. You just got to keep practicing working with this stuff and uh, you'll start to be able to read it a lot more clearly and quickly. It just will take a little bit to get used to. 
Okay, so let's do um, some examples with our uh, DeLorean here. All right, um, it's all great uh, to have you know the right fuel to get to the right destination year, but we also need to make sure the car has started and that we have the right speed, right? We're back to the speed. So um, we're gonna write uh, something that basically says, if the car is going 88 miles per hour, um, then we'll have one statement. If it's lower than 88, we'll have something else. If the car did not even start in the first place, then we need to say something else. So we have several different things here we have to evaluate. And one of these is clearly a bigger thing than the others, right? Um, the 88 miles per hour versus the lower than 88 doesn't even matter if the car hasn't started. So we're gonna start with, has the car started or not? That's our first logical thought. And say, if car has started, that evaluates directly. It's already a Boolean, it evaluates the true or false. So we'll say if the car has started, then we then we can look at the speed, right? Uh, otherwise, we're going to say, great, Scott, the starter has gone out again. Okay. Um, so if the car hasn't even started, we already know this is all we can do. But if the car has started, now we have more logic we can introduce to make another decision. So we'll say, you know, if the speed is exactly 88, uh, yeah, exactly 88, <laughs> eight miles per hour, then we will print, I'm going back to the future. Um, otherwise, else, we'll say, I'm not going quite fast enough yet. All right. So um, right now, car has started. Uh, car has started is true, and the speed is seventy-two. What are we going to see in the console when I run this? I'm not going quite fast yet. Yeah, the car has started, but we're not fast enough yet. So. I'm not going quite fast enough yet. Uh, let's change it to um, 88. Car has started, we're at 88. So we see I'm going back to the future, yeah. All right, but even if we're saying speed is uh, you know set to 88, um, if the car hasn't started, we don't even get there, right? So if we set this to false, it doesn't matter what value we've set speed to because it's never even gonna get there. It's just gonna say, great Scott, the starter has gone out again. And if I could emulate um, Christopher Lloyd, his actual voice, I totally would, cause he has an awesome voice. Okay, um, so there we go. Uh, that is nested conditionals using a bigger uh, logical decision and then having additional decisions um, if one thing is true versus another. And you can make this as complex as you want to, you can keep going. And in the real world, you often do um, have a lot of different things to consider. So you're going to have plenty of opportunities with between your exercises and your studios to start thinking through how to code these things and coming up with the right sequence. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's going to be times when um, you can do things in different order. You can decide to do the negative case before you do the positive case or, you know, whatever. It's up to you. Uh, you just have to make sure it makes sense. Um, and sometimes there are going to be um, logical sequences that are better than others. But you can experiment with it and see, you know, what makes sense to you and what's, you know, efficient and uses, you know, a, a small amount of code. Um, you'll get you'll get better and better at it as time goes on. OK, any more questions? Oops. Uh, before we take our break. With that example, if the speed had been 89, would the code say we're not going fast enough? Yeah. Um, what would happen? Um, it would say we're not going fast enough, absolutely, because I was checking for exactly 88, right? Um, so that's the kind of thing where that could introduce an unexpected result in your code. And um, developers have to deal with this all the time, both on the front end and the back end. Like when I'm when I'm working on a website, I there may be something that I have not accounted for in my logic 
and suddenly the website goes to, you know, it has a 404 not found page or it has, you know, some sort of error message pop up, some nasty error that the user <laughs> sees in the middle of the web page. You may have experienced this at some point where some developer did not think through all the possible options and have something to deal with that. We're going to talk about that uh, later on in the course. We're going to get into how do you handle errors. Uh, today, we're just going to talk about finding your errors and reading the error messages. But later on, we'll get into, you know, how do you you know, test and make sure you've thought through everything and then handle those errors so that you make sure the user doesn't uh, end up with some sort of thing that just doesn't make sense, right? So that's an excellent um, catch. I'm really glad you caught that. All right, um, any other questions? Okay, let's take a break, five minutes. Um, and this one has a music, so uh, prepare yourself. You can turn it down if you want. Um, I'll see you back in five minutes. We're going to talk about debugging. So this is um, this is chapter six, and uh, it's a short chapter. There's only really so much to talk about, so this will be short, and then we're going to get on to that pair programming um, topic. So um, it's helpful to understand uh, how to find the source of an error when they pop up. Um, in this case, uh, I want to just talk about... Um, the concepts of compiling and execution, how the code is actually, um, you know, uh, preparing itself to execute and run the program. Um, and then, you know, what's the anatomy of an error message? How do you break it down when you get all of that text just suddenly appearing, you know, in the console? And then what are some strategies for debugging? Um, and, you know, how do you learn to embrace error messages instead of feeling discouraged by them? How do you prevent errors? You know, how do you get better at that? Um, so let's start with the concepts of compiling and execution. There are two stages when your code uh, starts to run. Um, it actually cannot execute until it first compiles. It does this behind the scenes. Um, the code gets parsed and it gets rewritten into an executable file, executable file. And JavaScript catches um, any syntax errors. If there's something that it already knows, it does not know how to read, this is the stage in which it'll catch that. So you might see a syntax error pop up of some kind, um, reference error, things like that. Uh, reference errors uh, sometimes don't come up, though, until uh, execution, actually. So um, this is where, the if, the if the program has successfully compiled, it will start to run. And then um, you have these runtime errors, also known as exceptions, which, which suddenly you're moving along, everything's going great, and suddenly the program crashes and breaks and stops. Um, that's an execution um, uh, phase. It's a runtime error, an exception. Uh, and that's where reference error pops up. I misspoke earlier. Yeah. So, uh, you know, suddenly it comes across a variable it does not know how to find or something like that. Um, and uh, you may um, have discovered this already you do not get error messages when you just have an error in your logic. So uh, if you have something that you just haven't quite put in right, um, you're going to have to find that on your own. So let's uh, take a look at um, some of the things that can uh, happen here. Um, when you have error messages, first you want to look for the file name. Uh, it'll always tell you what the file name is. And then it'll take uh, it'll give you a line number so you can take note of that. And uh, then you can kind of say, okay, which part of the line is problematic? And a lot of times it'll point that out to you and it, it will be exactly right. This is where the problem is. Sometimes um, it won't, it'll be somewhere else, and but it'll give you a clue as to where you need to go look. And now uh, we'll have an example of that in a minute. Then you can notice the error type, right? Um, and then a specific message, it'll give you a message. So uh, again, there's the file name. Uh, here is that line number. So we're in index.js and, um, you know, this is uh, line number 46. And we have some sort of an error type, syntax error. And specifically, the me message is that it's an invalid or unexpected token, which is just uh, computer speak for saying, I came across something I don't know what to do with. It's not quite what I expected. Um, and... So you'll see something like this, and this will give you a clue as to where you can move on. In this case, it's saying, I think it's this line right here, line 46, right where I tried to console log. Oops, this has an error. Um, and that's correct. The error is in there somewhere. Does anybody see it? It's missing quotations at the end of error. Yeah. Um, and you can even see that because 
uh, the way this looked in the um, code editor, uh, it's still that kind of orangey color, right? Um, instead of it being white, uh, like it should, it should turn back white after the string is gone. So that, that helps too, seeing that kind of thing. Um, the code editors really help you out with the color coding. So uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so let's go ahead and live code some stuff. Um, actually, I mean, we're just gonna take some code that exists and we are going to uh, uncomment it and then try to figure out where these errors are. Okay, so we have a variable, let had first kiss equal true. And this is about uh, George and Lorraine, you know, um, needing to fall in love at the prom. Um, if they uh, have a first kiss, Marty McFly lives, he won't fade from existence. Otherwise, George and Lorraine didn't fall in love and he'll never be uh, born. So uh, we have some issues. We can already see VS Code is showing us we have some issues, right? Let's run it, though, just to see. I'm going to go uh, back to Chapter 6 here change directories, and then I will node debugging.js. Okay, we get an error message. This is helpful. So it tells us that it's in debugging.js at line 14, right here. And it says, uh, Marty McFly lives, he will not favor his assistance. Somewhere in here, we have a, a mistake. And uh, this should be a familiar mistake because we just looked at it, right? Um, we have uh, a, a missing quotation, that's right. So if we fix it, we come here and now everything looks right there, great. There's still an issue down here. Let's go ahead and run it to see uh, what it says about that and how that error message can help us. Missing okay. Other... What's that? Missing its other bracket. Yeah, so it this is an example of where it, it points you to one line, but the problem is actually on a different line. And often this has to do with unbalanced brackets. So uh, it tells us to go to line 17. It says, I, I came across something that I was not expecting to see here. Um, it's an unexpected token, um, syntax error, right? And then we go back and say, oh yeah, it's missing its, uh, its uh, corresponding opening bracket, right? So we can fix that, no problem. VS Code thinks it's being helpful and it gives us a closing bracket, but we can delete that. And now we have um, opening and closing and it's defining that code block properly. Okay, so now there's there's no, um, no uh, errors that we can see here. So uh, we expect this to be, um, to work and be true. And so we run it. And it says, um, Marty McFly lives. He will not fade from existence because they had their first kiss. And you think, oh, that's great. Let's say later on down the road, that variable is not true. It's false. You're going along. You're thinking your code is working great. You run it again and you get the same result. And you're like, wait a second. Why did it not get my other thing? This, there's no error message for this. This is a logic error. So can anybody tell me, can you figure it out? It might take some some doing. You might have to look at it for a second. The uh, after the if statement, it's a string instead of a variable. Yes, this is a very common mistake to make, um, especially when you're really really new at this. This condition, if you put this in as a string instead of a variable name it's always going to evaluate as true because we learned that strings that have a length are truthy, right? Um, they'd have to be an empty string to evaluate to false. So this will never evaluate to false ever. Um, so we have to take those quotes off and actually reference the variable that we created. And now we see it's white, you know, it's the same color as this on, on, on my computer anyway, might be different on yours. Um, that means that it is recognizing this as a reference to that. In fact, you can hover over it and see that it recognizes, hey, that's that variable you created um, that is currently set to false. So now when we run it, our code works as expected because um, we actually are referring to the variable and it's, it's evaluating it on the basis of its value that's stored. Okay, anybody got any questions about that before I continue? Okay, so um, yeah, that's how it's done. So the the, uh, the strategies you want to employ here, again, think like a computer, right? Computers are logical. You have to learn how to think that way. So follow the sequence of the code, read it from top to bottom, examine your conditional logic. Um, you know, are you actually, you know, step by step, is it evaluating things the way you expected it to? 
pay attention to very small details, these brackets and, you know, different types of uh, things that are required for JavaScript syntax are essential. It does not know how to operate if, if one of those things is missing. Um, console log can be your friend. If you don't have an error message uh, and um, you don't know why, let's say that I was doing something that didn't actually already have a console log in it. It was just supposed to set a value for something and that value gets used later on somewhere. I have to come back and say, oh, maybe the problem is here. Then I can start putting some console logs in here so that I can see the input because I know that console log is only going to execute if it enters one of those code blocks, right? That can be a very good strategy for uh, temporarily putting something in just to narrow down how is the code executing? What path is it following? Is it going into this code block? Is it going into this code block? Um, developers do this every day. Uh, so you can check those values of your variables and your expressions at different points in your code to see where it's hitting. Um, and you can use uh, you know, titles of things, new lines, symbols, whatever you want to make those logs really easy to see and pop out at you if you have a lot of output in there and you need to just kind of see it. Um, that's gonna become a lot more relevant when we get into more complex code, when we're working on websites and things like that where you might have a lot of stuff running, um, you'll wanna you know, make it real obvious. Um, you can mark your temporary code with comments, which will help you remember, oh, hey, when I'm all done with my development process, I want to go and clean up my code and go back later and take all that stuff out. So you can kind of mark it up and just say temporary or something like that. That'll help you remember. Um, but bottom line, you want to remember that errors help you learn. They're not something to be uh, scared of or ashamed of. Uh, experienced programmers. There we go. Experienced programmers make mistakes all the time. It's the way it goes. We do not ever arrive at a point where we stop making mistakes. That's not how it works. <laughs> so it's just part of the process of problem solving. It's You're not going to automatically think of everything every single time. So you're going to have to just accept that and get used to it and not let it discourage you. Um, you just have to remember what these strategies are for dealing with it so that you can get to the bottom of it, you know, as quickly as possible, because if you can't figure it out, you're going to get real frustrated. Um, so you'll get better and better at this, and you'll have lots of opportunities to because you will make lots of mistakes, and that's totally okay. Um, so the way to do that is, uh, you know, strategies for that is to work on very small ch chunks of code at a time and test your code often. Don't just uh, write a bunch of code, write a bunch of code, write a bunch of code, and then test it, because then you'll have a harder time narrowing down, oh, shoot, something didn't go the way I wanted it to where did I go wrong, right? But if you're testing it, as soon as you write like one more logical process, even if it means throwing a couple of temporary console logs in there just to uh, see you know, what it's doing, test it often, a little bit at a time. Um, because it, yeah, it's just easier to find those mistakes when you have less things to examine, right? And then be methodical um, about how you approach your coding. You're designing a program and doing a lot of different things. Um, as you learn how to build, uh, more complex programs with a lot of different moving parts, you want to be very, very methodical. This is why graded assignment one is split up into three parts, because we want to help you uh, do this a little bit at a time. So we don't want you to have to just dive in and try to figure it all out all at once. You're going to start small. Um, so that that pro practice of being methodical is going to serve you really, really well. So you're going to learn those strategies and then just apply that every single time you do something new. Okay, who has questions about any of that? Nope. Okay. Um, then the last thing we want to talk about is pair programming. So I'm going to talk about this for a minute, and then I'm going to pass it over to Patrick and Delaney so they can do a demo for us. So this idea of pair programming is um, a method of collaborating with another person to develop a solution. So it's very common with teams in the real world, especially when you're a junior developer. You uh, can work with other junior developers to figure things out, or sometimes you'll pair up with a senior developer so that they can teach you how to do things um, and you can learn from them. Um, I just said that. Okay, junior devs learning together, senior devs mentoring junior devs, right? Um, and you might say, you know, what difference does it make? Why, you know, uh, but two heads are better than one. You're going to come up with, you know, more interesting solutions or things you didn't think of because somebody else thinks of it first. Uh, it speeds up your learning process. You come up with more creative solutions. 
And um, you also are more likely to catch errors. One person might see something the other person didn't see. They're, they've already moved on mentally to the next thing and didn't see that typo they made or that you know bracket they left out. Uh, so when you're working together, ultimately you're gonna produce better quality code. Um, so this will also, as uh, Colin um, mentioned, uh, you know, there's things that we're going to teach you um, that are going to help you with the interviewing process. Being on video is one of those things since so many interviews are done remotely. But there's also this concept called live coding an interview. And every once in a while, you'll have an interview where they do a technical interview and they want you to code for them right there in the moment. Um, that sounds really scary. It can be at first, but if you practice it, you'll get better at it. Um, don't worry about it right now. Um, but this process of pair programming is going to get you so comfortable with working with other people and just coding in front of people and talking about it while you do it, that it's going to really bridge that gap for you and make it a lot easier for you to transition to the higher stakes, you know, coding in front of an interviewer, you know, um, somebody you've never met before where you're hoping to um, land a job. So um, that's, these are lots of different reasons why it's a good thing. So how does it work? There are a couple different approaches that people generally take. The first method would be the driver and the observer. The driver types the code. They talk about what they're thinking as they're going along. This is kind of what you do with a live coding in an interview. And the observer is watching. Um, they're thinking ahead. They're asking questions. They might help you catch your typer, typos and logic errors. Uh, they might go off and research an issue, research how to do something real quick while you're, you know, typing away. Um, and this is how you this is how you collaborate and work together. Um, that's one mo model. The other one is the idea of a driver and a navigator, where you have one person typing and just focusing on what's right in front of them, but the navigator is guiding that process and and thinking about the big picture and kind of you know telling that person what to do. Regardless of which one of these methods you choose to employ, communication is the key. Um, you have to balance talking and listening um, because both of you need to participate, right? And sometimes you might be doing this with three people and all three of you need to be able to participate. You want to um, actively be open to learning from each other. Um, it requires give and take. Not one person is going to have all the answers and everyone needs to have an opportunity to have some answers. So you might be real strong. You might have experience in this already and be real strong. Don't forget to give the person you're pairing with an opportunity to contribute um, just because you might be already on the ball. Um, everyone needs an opportunity to you know, jump in and have a, have a chance to contribute. So um, you know, that, that's something that has to be learned and practiced uh, it, it, as a, uh, a dynamic between the two of you, okay? Um, you want to switch roles every once in a while. You don't want one person doing the same thing the entire time. So you want to kind of uh, switch off. If you have personality conflicts, and you will because we're humans, and that's what we do, um, patience, humility, and kindness go a very long way. If you find yourself suddenly going, oh my gosh, like this is driving me crazy, you know, back yourself down, do a little bit of self-talk on the inside. Um, find a way to uh, just, you know, work together because um, you're going to have to do that on the job. Every once in a while, you're going to run up against somebody that you you just don't get each other. You don't communicate well. Your personality doesn't necessarily mesh real well. And you you need to practice that now. This is how we work together, you know, in a team environment and uh, developing, um, you know, software engineering, it's all about teamwork. So um, th these are good things to practice. So truly cooperative collaboration takes practice. You're going to get lots of this. This is why we encourage you to collaborate and solve your problems together during your studio times. Okay. And it's something you cannot do with your graded assignments because those you're required to do on your own. So studio is where you really, really want to do this. And your um, IAs are going to make it um, possible for you to break out into smaller rooms where you and one or two other people can just, you know, focus on that together in your own little room. If you're doing this uh, today, uh, for example, um, on on uh, on Zoom, uh, when you are physically in a space, you guys might all be sitting around, you know, in, in an area and you just kind of group up and, you know, you might have another team of people sitting right next to you, but that's fine. Um, and th in that case, you're kind of looking over each other's shoulders. In a Zoom environment, you're going to be sharing your screen and just talking about it that way. Okay, so um, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Patrick and Delaney.
to do a demo for you and show you what this looks like. I have given them a problem to solve. They're going to read the instructions and talk about it a little bit, decide who's going to do the coding first and, you know, who's who's and they're going to decide kind of what model to use. Is this driver observer or the driver navigator? And uh, we're going to see how this goes. So I'm going to stop sharing and let one of them share. You guys ready? Yes. Yep. All right. Take. Cool. Do you want to share or do you want me to share, Patrick? Um, I, I can go ahead and share. Okay. Perfect. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Awesome. All right. How are you doing today, Delaney? Uh, Delaney? I'm doing great. I know. Okay. Oh, hey. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it looks like uh, we're going to write a program to help us figure out how to spend our allowance. Um, so it looks like uh, looks like we've got some, you know, some numbers here that are going to tell us, like, you know, what we get to get with our allowance, depending on how much it is. Um, and we're just going to kind of write a conditional statement to print the different results based on what that uh, what that allowance is. Um, so I guess you want to start with driving or do you want me to start with driving we want to oh. navigate or observe or how do we want to do this i can definitely start with my hands on the keyboard um okay. how about let's start off with doing like a little bit of pseudocode so that we can pair these instructions yeah. down to be a little bit more palatable uh we have a clear idea of what we're doing um good. and then from there we can jump into that conditional statement so that's good all right so it looks like uh well, again, we need to uh, figure out what we're going to do with our money. Um, yep. And so if we've got at least 25, but less than 45, we're going to get some earbuds. Pretty basic. Uh, nothing super fancy. Um, yeah, 25 to 45 gets us earbuds. And then let's see, if we have at least 45, but less than 70, we're going to get a new laptop bag. Um to make it easier to join our launch code, stu launch code study buddies at the local coffee shop. There was some mention about hanging out at a coffee shop earlier this morning, wasn't there? Yeah, all right. Here we go. All right. And what are we doing if we get, is, th is there a, a case for above 70 or no? Yeah, above 70. Um, we get both. Okay. And is there anything to account for less than 25 in the instructions? Um, You know, it sure doesn't. So what do we think when we do that? Just kind of say, uh, all right. If you have less than broke. 25, we're broke. We can't yeah. do anything that. Awesome. Yeah, we need we need to save up a little bit more for those earbuds. Cool. So I think this covers all of our, our situations. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, can you remind me how to write a conditional statement? Yeah, we start with the uh with that if word just because you know it's that's our condition, if. Um, and then let's see here. What do you think about the order on this one? Should we like, I don't know, should we do 45 first? Um, sure. Yeah, let's start with 45. Okay. So, so yeah, let's if, uh, let's see here. If our money is less than 45. All right. Um, and we're just going to print a statement here. It says, uh, what was that? We get earbuds. Earbuds for those tunes, yes. Cool. All you right. Want me to run it. See what happens. Yeah, let's run it. Great. Oh, geez. Oh wow. Okay. Money That's very undefined. red. Okay, money is undefined. So, looks like we have a reference error. Uh oh, I know what it is. Yeah. I think we forgot to make a money variable. <laughs> awesome. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let money, and uh, how much money should we have? This so time. Just, yeah, somewhere in the middle. Let's just do 30 for now. Just to okay. Let's do 30. Testing. And let's uh stop this. And let me stop swinging my thing around and run it again. Yay, we're getting your buds. buds. Woot. Awesome. Should we try it with any other test cases? Um, yeah, what happens? So we've got uh got something for less than 25. So let's see. Uh, let's change that to like 20 and see what we end up with. Okay. What's that? What's that should tell us that we're broke with less than $25. Oh. We are still getting earbuds. Well, we can't afford earbuds. 
yeah not yet no definitely not yet okay cool we gotta we gotta change something then what do you think yeah i'm think i'm thinking let's go ahead and do that uh do that money is less than 25 first okay and then we should change this to yeah to broke you broke okay and then should we do an else statement or an else if um yeah we've got more than two things let's do an else if okay and so this one we're going to do if money is is less than 45 right yeah cool. right and now we can do if i can spell correctly anyways sorry nobody saw that i scrolled up on the screen <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's okay. It was mostly me just making an insane amount of typos. Awesome. All right, cool. And let's try running it. Uh, so this is money is twenty. So we should we should get the year broke. Yeah. Yay, we're no, broke. In fact, broke. This is so exciting, or not exciting? Okay. Not exciting. <laughs> let's try with the thirty. Let's see if that if that works properly. Yay! Yeah, yearbook. Those are yearbook. exciting. Awesome. Uh, so it looks like that's starting. Do you want to, do you want to switch? Do you want to yeah, have I'll, your hands on the keyboard so you can get some practice? Go ahead and take over a little bit. Yeah. My, uh, I don't know, warm my hands up a little bit. It's a little chilly in here. All yeah. Right. Awesome. So I think we're going to need another else if statement because now we're, we're stair stepping up. Okay. Yeah. All else right. If. Uh, money is less than 70. All right. Open those curly braces. And so in this case, that means that we get to have a laptop bag. So go ahead and console log uh, laptop bag in quotes. Yay, very exciting. Yay. Awesome. Right. Okay, go ahead and, and let's test it out. Let's change money to like 50. Let's try that. All right. And actually, I'm going to hit this button up here just to kind of yeah, really clean it out. out a little bit. And then I almost try to jump in there and type and PM something. Laptop <laughs> bag. Woohoo. Great. Perfect. So is that our last case? Awesome. Um, no, I don't think that's our last case. We, oh, uh, shoot, you're we're right. going to handle like if, uh, if that allowance money is particularly generous, right? <laughs> All right. So I don't think that we need to have another if state for, for this one. I think this is our last one. So yeah. we could probably just do an else. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Else. Right. And then uh just you know. Just just print out a little message for it. Yeah. So much money. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Uh how about let's change money to just like an insanely big number? Okay, let's do that. Okay. Very, right, very right, large, right, right, large right, allowance right. here. <laughs> Let, let's hope that doesn't throw an error on us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We can definitely get both of that much. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Cool. I think that's it. Do we, do we miss anything? Um, I think we forgot to do a syntax error on purpose, but other than that, I think we did forget to do a syntax <laughs> error on purpose, but you know what? <laughs> I think, I think everyone will be comfortable with making syntax errors on their own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. great job guys oh everybody give it up for uh delaney and patrick all right yes i love how you pretended to be beginners at this um the entire time you were doing that um makes it more relatable for everybody right so that's the process guys you just work together you talk about it you bounce ideas off one another, you take turns. Um, and by the way, they were using an online tool called Replit. I mentioned that I think yesterday um, that you can actually like invite somebody else to it as a collaborator and, um, you know, just do a quick uh, program and run it right there in the browser. Um, and then, you know, both be typing as you go. So there's lots of tools like that if you guys want to do it that way. Um, ultimately, you need to turn in your code as part of that repository um, where those studio assignments already are. Um, and it totally is cool. Like if you guys are working together to solve it, then at the end, just whoever ends up with the code, you know, just y'all copy and paste it into your individual repositories to turn it in because you, you solved it together, right? And that's totally all right. Okay, so we uh, we covered a lot today. Um, hopefully this has helped you get a better handle though on um, conditionals and how to start to introduce logic into your program. 
uh, I have more practice um, on my website for this. There's a couple of exercises specific to uh, conditionals, intro to conditionals and more unconditionals. So if you've got a little bit of extra time in your, um, as you, after you, uh, you know, prepare for tomorrow's class, um, you could jump in and, and do some of these and it'll make it even uh, stronger in your head.